So in this video, we'll be having a look at Hatshepsut's religious policy. So we're aiming to see what aspects of religion Hatshepsut maintained uh, that were tradition. And we're also looking to see those uh, elements of religion that she innovated and, and introduced that were new, uh, and particularly those that continued after her reign. So we'll start with the traditional policies. So Amun Ra is, of course, a state god during this time period, and Hatshepsut continued to promote Amun. Uh, and we see that in a variety of different ways in her um, in her reign, from uh, her building program, which uh, substantially was to support Amun and the Amun priesthood, uh, through to her uh, military campaigns, which were done in honour of Amun. And also her uh, her uh, expedition apart, which was primarily for um, to the Amun priesthood. Uh, she didn't neglect other cults and other Egyptian gods and goddesses, uh, and she had a particular focus during this time period on the female goddesses, in particular uh, Hathor and and Paket. Uh, so we see Hathor here uh, on the left hand side in the feminine version of, of Hathor, and we also see uh, Hathor in the cow version, version in the divine birth scenes, which are at Deir or Bari. So she's suckling from Hathor after she's born from Amun and her mother. Here's uh, Paquette here. Paquette was a lion-headed goddess, uh, which was a, another version of Hathor, in fact, uh, and was a, a goddess of the desert. And we see her devotion to Paquette in uh, the restoration of the temple at Spiros Artemis, or Spiros Artemis. Uh, a really good quote in regards to religion is from Jan Arsman. So he says that the starting point was Hatshepsut's reign was the starting point of revolutionary changes that occurred in the religious history of the New Kingdom. So he really uh, attributes Hatshepsut to a whole heap of religious innovation during her reign uh, and a lot of the things that we come to know the New Kingdom period for in regards to religion are because of the innovations of hatchets so, and we'll see some of these as we as we move through. So when we break down religious expression during this time we're thinking of cultic practices so those things that would take place at, at, festi uh, sorry, at temples so the cult uh, work of the king and, uh, and the priests during this time period uh, and we see also uh, the festivals that would occur and we'll look at those more closely soon and in class and also through the building program where we see uh, buildings particularly for Amun uh, or dedicated to Amun, particularly the Robari for Hatshepsut, Spiros Artemis, and also um, the, uh, the temple complex at Karnak. So we're going to have a quick overview of the innovations that Hatshepsut introduced as a part of her reign. This is a really brief overview. There's a far more depth than what we'll go into now, but this will give us an idea of those things that she introduced during her reign that were important and continued after her reign. So Amun-Ra, one of the things that she introduced were epithets, which are ways that we can describe the god uh, or kind of descriptive aspects of, of, of a god and, and attributes of that god. So she started providing these uh, epithets to add more depth to the description of Amun-Ra and give him, in fact, more roles and, and significance. So calling Amun-Ra the creator god, so the, the god that created everything, the city god who was responsible for for, for the city of Thebes, uh, the primeval god, the god that existed before all things, and the ruler god, uh, the god that ruled over all the other gods in, in mankind. So by providing these epithets, she's adding more description and more substance to uh, the attributes that we have for Amun Ra. Uh, and this is something that continued after Hatshepsut's reign as well. We also have divine oracles, which is where Amun is expressing uh, his will, uh, in particular that Hatshepsut become king. And we see that in the Red Chapel uh, scenes that are depicted where there's an oracle of Amun, which uh, would predicts the fact that Hatshepsut should become king, therefore justifying her claim to the throne. And this is also something that's continued by later kings after her reign. We also see personal piety introduced. So this is the concept of having a personal relationship with a god, which really didn't exist before this time period. Uh, and we see that in, this, uh, in, in the festivals where we know that the bark of Amun, as it's being carried, uh, people could ask personal questions to Amun being carried on this bark, uh, and depending on the way it dipped and swayed as it's being carried, that would provide an, an answer to that particular person as to their question. Um, this also provided people with a sense of that they would personally, needed to be personally, um, um, you know, have good morals and also a person of integrity, and that was their responsibility to their God as a part of this concept of personal piety. Uh, we also need to understand that there was a, a religious, religious aspects of the ideology of kingship, so there's a, a really significant relationship between the king and Amun, and this is particularly through the divine birth and coronation scenes that we see that Hatshepsut sort of introduced. Um, so they really legitimised her reign, but also really showed that relationship between the king and Amun and cemented that relationship um, as sort of father and son or father and daughter in this case. Um, and we see the importance of these by the fact that Ramesses II later on replicates these um, in his own scenes. We also have uh, an influence, as we mentioned before, on the sacred feminine. Uh, we've mentioned Hathor and Paquette, uh, Paquette at, at the Temple of Spiros Artibaros, uh, and Hathor in the Divine Birth Scenes. But we also have the, a, a chapel dedicated to Hathor at Dira uh, Bari, um, and that uh, actually provides a link, and we'll look at more of this in class, provides a link between Hathor and Isis and kind of sees a little bit of a merging of them. So we kind of see an emphasis on these three uh, goddesses during this time period. Uh, festivals are another innovation for Hatshepsut. She introduced two new festivals during her time period, which continued after her reign, the beautiful festival in the valley and the Opet festival, both carrying that bark of Amun, as you can see in this image there. Uh, finally, she had some new funerary innovations. So we would have all heard of the Book of the Dead. The Book of the Dead has its first appearance uh, in scrolls and in you know, reliefs in Hatshepsut's reign. We also have the Amduat, which is a royal funerary text, which was introduced during Hatshepsut's reign, uh, and the Alidini of Amun-Ra, so another piece of scripture that was introduced during Hatshepsut's reign in regards to funerary innovations. So quite a lot of innovations happened in regards to religion during Hatshepsut's reign. 
Finally, a couple of quick quotes from historians about an overview of, of religion, and they are quite divided, some of these historians. Uh, Barry Kemp says that uh, monarchy required the backing of myth and the regular reinforcement of cere ceremony. So in other words, to, to be powerful as a king, you needed to have a mythology behind you, and in Hatshepsut's case, it was through the divine birth scenes, and they were reinforced by the ceremonies that took place in the cultic practices at the temples. And they overcome the shortcomings of an individual king, and Hatshepsut's major shortcoming is obviously the fact that she is female. So Barry Kemp sort of sees this as, as really important for Hatshepsut, the, the backing of myth and the regular reinforcement of ceremony. So good little quotes that we can use. And he also talks about the mutual absorption of King and Amun, particularly through these divine birth scenes. Uh, so the King and Amun become almost one. Um, so to defy, to defy the King or to not support the King is therefore not supporting uh, Amun. Uh, so it ensured that Hatshepsut would maintain the support of her people and her administration. Uh, we have Redford who says um, that the Amun priesthood had become really, really powerful during this time period. Uh, and they become so powerful, in fact, that they almost uh, governed uh, and d d decided who could be in control. Uh, and uh, this is an argument that's not supported by many, uh, so but it is worth knowing and using in your response that Redford has this argument that they become so powerful that Hatchets really owed her position to them uh, and, and needed their support. Uh, finally, O'Connor tells us that uh, he completely disagrees with Redford and says, no, that's not quite true. The priests, particularly armed priests, were always subordinate to the king and could never really um, undertake a divisive uh, theological initiative. Um, so a bit of an overview of Hatchets' religion. It's a, quite a long video, I apologise, but there's a, quite a lot going on there.